Today's scripture comes from James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This is the word of the Lord. The white space between Bible verses is fertile soil for questions. Think about that. The white space between Bible verses is fertile soil for questions. One can hardly read the scripture without whispering, I wonder. The innkeeper, too busy to welcome God, did he ever learn who he turned away? The shepherds, did they ever hum the song the angels sang? The wise men who followed the star, what was it like to worship a toddler? And Joseph, did he ever look up from his prayers and see Jesus listening? What ever happened to him? His role in Act One is so crucial that we expect to see the rest of the drama. But with the exception of a short scene with 12-year-old Jesus in Jerusalem, he never reappears. And we are left with our questions. My first question would be about the night in the stable. Moonlit pastures, stars twinkle above, Bethlehem sparkles in the distance. I picture Joseph pacing outside the stable. He'd done all he could do to prepare as comfortable a place for Mary as he could in a barn, and then he stepped out. She'd asked to be alone, and Joseph has never felt more so. In that eternity between his wife's dismissal and Jesus' arrival, what was he thinking? I wonder if he said, This isn't how I planned it, God. <laughs> Not at all. My child to be born in a cave with, with sheep and donkeys? My wife to give birth with only the stars to hear her pain? This isn't what I imagined. Not at all. I imagined family and grandmothers and neighbors clustered outside the door and friends standing at my side. I imagined the house just erupting with the first cry of the infant. Slaps on the back, loud laughter, jubilation. But now look. Here we are in a sheep pasture. Who will celebrate with us? Did I miss something, God? When you sent the angel and spoke of the baby to be born, I envisioned Jerusalem, the temple, the priests, and the people gathered to watch. A pageant, perhaps. A parade. A banquet, at least. I mean, this is the Messiah. This isn't what I wanted for my son. Oh, oh my. I did it again, didn't I, Lord? I don't mean to do that. I just forgot. He's, he's not my son. He's yours. The child is yours. The plan is yours. The idea is yours. And if you don't mind me asking, is this how God enters the world? When you sent the angel and gave us the promise, I can understand that. All the questions about the pregnancy, I can tolerate that. And even the trip to Bethlehem, maybe. But why a birth in a stable, God? That's what the angel explained to us. 
And that's what Mary believes. And God, my God, that's what I want to believe, but surely you can understand. It's not easy. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Gracious Father, your ways are so far above our ways that our wildest imaginations can't even begin to conceive your plans. I celebrate the wonder of the birth of your son, and I bow my heart to what you want to do in and through my life. In Jesus' name, amen. James 13 to 17 of, verse, of chapter 4 as... Nick read to us just a bit ago. He talks about the plans that we make, the boasting that we make when we make our own plans. Don't we feel for poor Joseph, who in this instance had to change his plans for marriage? And then after finding out that Mary was with child, not of his own, he had to change plans his plans for the birth of the child. Instead of celebrating new life, the birth takes place in obscurity. Not what he planned. The best laid plans of mice and men go often askew and leave us nothing but grief and pain for promising joy. Does anybody know where that line comes from? Are you well-read English people? That's a poem written by Robert Burns in 1785 with the rather lengthy title, To a Mouse on Turning Her Up in Her Nest with the Plow, in November of 1785. According to legend, Burns was plowing in the fields and accidentally destroyed a mouse's nest, which it needed to survive the winter. In fact, Burns' brother claimed that the poet composed the poem while still holding his plow. John Steinbeck took the title of his 1937 novel, Of Mice and Men, from that one line. And there are notices of three or four other books that came out of that. And in fact, there was even a song by one of my favorite groups back in the 70s, Jethro Tull, called One Brown Mouse. Isn't that interesting? James is telling us that when we make our own plans without consulting God, our plans often go awry, or as James says it, we are but a mist. I was looking through the Bible yesterday for God's word on plans. The first one that comes to mind is another well-known, very much beloved line from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not for harm or for your welfare or for peace, depending on the translation that you have. Why is it so important to do it God's way? Well, God then answers us in verses 12 and 13. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I shall hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. And here's the kicker, the important part of it. When you search for me with all of your heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 tell us, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. We need to search for him and his will with all our hearts for everything we do, not just on Sunday mornings or for church things, but at all times. God looks to us to trust him, to rely on him, to choose our ways. Do you? Do I? How many times have we said, okay, I got to do this and this and that, and then we get into it and things go wrong and the outcome is futile and we think, oh, I didn't ask God. I just went ahead and did my own thing. Or we, when we get into the mess 
And then we say, God, get me out of this mess. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 tells us, Sometimes there is a way that seems right to a man, but the way leads to death. Proverbs 19, 21 states, The human mind may devise many plans, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. Proverbs 16, 9 says, The human mind plans a way, but the Lord directs the steps. Another in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 I really love this, how simple it says. Sorry, my mouth <clears throat> dried the cold. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get wisdom. Another version says, acquire wisdom. And with your acquiring, obtain understanding. It really doesn't get any simpler than that. How do you get wisdom? Read God's word. See all the marks I got in there? <clears throat> do you know that the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters? That equates to one chapter of Proverbs per day of the month. Just read one chapter each day for each month. You have to use your math skills on figure out the readings for the months of days less than 31. And do that all year. That's how you obtain wisdom. That's how you plan your plans God's way. There are many, many on the um, internet ways to read through the Bible in a year. <clears throat> I've been doing it for, I don't know, 20 years, it's reading through the Bible. Just five chapters a day will get you through. Now, there's one, Psalm 119. You kind of have to break that up. It's a little long. It's 150 verses in one chapter. So that's a little long. But there's also, like Psalm 23, there's only six verses in that. And there's some others that are even shorter than that. So you'll gauge it as you get going. There are other choice verses in Proverbs Here's one, 1026. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are the lazy to their employer. Does that have anything to do with making plans? No, I just threw that one in there because I liked it. <laughs> a couple, uh, several months ago, I was, we have an old refrigerator out in the garage and I keep a bottle of water in there among a, our overflow in there and I reached in the door to get my bottle of water and picked it up, took a big swallow, and oh my gosh, guess what it was? It was not water, bottled water, it was vinegar. <laughs> so I can tell you from first-hand experience that it is one of the most horrible things you've ever drunk in your life. And it wasn't apple cider vinegar, it was a straight <laughs> vinegar. <clears throat> Carlene will tell you how I came in the house after that. <laughs> and we've all been at a fire like you can't fire something and the smoke gets your eyes and it just irritates. So are the lazy to their employer. Here's another one, 1122. As a gold ring in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. I didn't write that. It's in the Bible. It's worthless. It's worthless. God sees from the inside. We see from the outside. Oh, she's beautiful. There's nothing there. Are you sensing a pattern here? There's a lot of wisdom in how to make our plans God's way. Where does peace come from? Where does peace come from? Peace comes from when we are aligned with God in his spirit for our lives and live our lives for him. Learn God's word so you can make your plans with his wisdom. Ask God to give you wisdom, but you have to make first steps. God will provide. Do the right thing and don't sin. May God open our hearts and our ears to the hearing of his word and bless it to our understanding.